Um, so first of all, thank you everybody uh, for dialing in. Looks like we've got uh, a good cross section of people dialed in today. So uh, um, those of you who um, know your way around WebEx, uh, you can you can see who else is on through the attendee list. Um, some people do have some issues connecting to WebEx, so we do have a dial-in facility as well. If you do have issues with your uh, Wi-Fi at home or whatever, then please do note down that um, teleconference facility. You can dial in through that directly as well. Um, we'll run this in the same way we did the last advisory group. So um, I'm afraid we're going to mute you all. Um, uh, people want to mute me sometimes. I was muted when I first came on the call. Thanks, Dan. Um, but what we'll use is the chat facility within a WebEx. So uh, if you uh, click on the uh, bubble that comes up when you move your mouse or your trackpad, that'll take you to the chat um, function and you can add any questions in there. And what we'll do is we will address questions from the chat function when we pause at the uh, at the end of our um, presentations. Um, I think particularly for our more interactive sessions, for our breakout sessions, um, please do add comments in in chat as we go, and then we can address them at the end. If, if we sort of wait till the end, then what happens is we have a nice big dramatic pause whilst everyone types in questions and then a flood of things at the end. So if you do think of questions as we're going through it, please do add them into the chat function uh, and we will address them as we go through. It's better to use the chat rather than the Q&A function. So um, if you can just bear that in mind. And then when you make your comments in chat, can you address them to everyone and not just the host? Otherwise, Dan then has to um, forward them on to all for transparency. Um, you'll be pleased to hear we have scheduled a 10 minute break in, into the uh, agenda for today about uh, 11 o'clock. We'll just maybe just uh, flex that a little bit if we are taking longer or, or less. But um, the intention is to, to build that in and there's, there's a, a, a break in the agenda. So hopefully that is um, clear with anyone. As usual, we've got the open networks email address at the bottom. Um, any feedback, any information we want to receive, or, or if you want to get in touch with us more generally, uh, open networks at energynetworks.org. Thank you, Dan. If we move on. So, just a reminder of our terms of reference. I think all of you um, who are on the call are probably pretty familiar with what we do and what our objective is. But it's the advisory group is is an essential element for for us in in open networks it is an opportunity for us to keep stakeholders up to speed with where we are and what we're doing um and so it is uh, an information um uh, a means for us to distribute information out of the project but the most important and valuable piece for us is to get your input into our development work as we go as we go along in in some of our key areas so again, today we have a, a set of products and development work we're bringing to you for some input, and I'd encourage as much feedback and input as possible as we go through those um, virtual breakout sessions. So again, you know, it's not as um, dynamic and interactive using the, the the web facilities that we have. So please do, um, I'd encourage you to to raise things into the chat function so that it gets taken into account and we have as um, as dynamic a discussion as we can do um, with the constraints of technology. Thank you, Dan. So the running order from today, uh, we've done the first bit, uh, almost on target. Um, we then run through some, some updates to keep you informed on, on what's happening with some of our areas of development. And then we'll have our, our breakout sessions a bit later, um, looking at uh, looking at some of our development work. So um, we'll have a little bit on the flexibility consultation that's in progress in drafting at the moment. Uh, there's a session on the contract and commercial arrangements that is subject to um, review of stakeholder feedback. Uh, and Alex Harris will run through that a bit later. We have um, some work being done on the whole system fares we're going to run through uh, and uh, an important piece of work on signposting potential network capacity requirements. So I think that is a, a key element uh, for transparency for information out to you all as stakeholders. So hopefully 
um, a, a good uh, cross-section of, of things that are of interest and certainly areas where we would like your input. Uh, again, you know, if there are any particular areas that you feel that we should be bringing that we're not bringing, again, just drop it in, in feedback and, um, and and we'll pick them up for, for the next session in, in September. Thanks, Dan. So I'm going to give a quick update on, on progress. I probably should have introduced myself at the beginning of that spiel for, for those of you who um, don't recognise my voice or haven't met me before. My name's Jason Brogdon. And I'm the project director here at ENA for the Open Networks project. So I, I have specific responsibility for, for Open Networks, and that's why I'm uh, I'm fronting up and taking you through an update on on what we're doing um, here today. So just a, a whistle stop tour through what we've been doing, what we've issued, and what's coming next. So uh, we have. Um, published the results of our work plan consultation and our updated 2020 PID in May. So you've all got visibility of, um, of our work plan for this year and how we've taken into account the comments that you all raised. So we have a, a published a, a set of slides that show uh, you said we did to show how we've responded to your comments on, on our work plan. And we have um, tailored our plan accordingly. Uh, Alex is going to talk about the standard contract uh, that's current, currently subject to stakeholder review and update. We're looking at release two for that, so I won't steal the thunder. Uh, and nor will I, um, Fiona, uh, talking through the conflicts of interest and unintended consequences register and Steve on the DSO implementation plan. Um, we've talked a number of times through with you the queue management consultation, which has now closed, and we are analysing responses to that. So we will again be responding back on that queue management consultation. And then in the bottom left, there's a list of other publications that we have um, published on the ENA website in conclusion of uh, our development work in uh, the programme. I think if I'm going to draw attention to anything in there, uh, what we've got a series of Workstream 4, the, it, which is our whole energy systems workstream. Um, we have um, we we've published a set of output on that, and we are continuing a number of areas of development for our liaison between gas and electricity. We've got um, uh, Tom Collar uh, briefing on the Gas Goes Green project a bit later, and we're going to be using um, each other's advisory groups to to keep you informed on what's happening on the Gas Goes Green project and. Um, uh, vice versa, we will be informing the Gas Go Goes Green advisory group on, on our progress in open networks. And that whole energy systems development piece is, is very important and, and key for us, the collaboration between gas and electricity. So I'll just, just pick that out and hopefully that's um, uh, a nice intro to, to Tom's brief a bit later. Coming up uh, in the next quarter, flex consultation. Um, the scope and report for DFES standardization, uh, both of which being covered today. Um, we have the implementation of the next phase of the system wide resource register. So that is being linked in with the embedded capacity register that has been, that, that is um, for off gem decision under DCP 350 in DECUSA. So we are um, ensuring that we're being consistent with what's coming out of the DECUSA modifications and more transparency and data for, for assets. Uh, but that is um, due for implementation, uh, just depending on how we align with that embedded capacity register. Then um, I've got an event slide a bit later, we'll cover the community energy forums. I saw that Emma was on the uh, attendee list, so I'm very pleased to, to have Community Energy England um, today. So uh, uh, we'll, we'll give some more details around our, our plans for those forums uh, close to the time. Um, and then the last one is around data sharing process for gas on the whole system FES. So again, we're, we're doing the work around future energy scenarios. We're looking at how we can provide um, more input into that from the gas side. So a bit of a whistle stop tour about uh, through um, what's recently been published and, and what we've done, as well as giving you a bit of a heads up on, on, on what's coming next.
realize this is a bit of a monologue, bit of a show and tell, but these these up these these first ones uh, are always a bit more um, information giving uh, rather than um, uh, proactive uh, interactive discussion. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, uh, so an, a link into our um, events. So LinkedIn, we've, we've got a few things linked in with our products. We have um, webinars to um, to, to disseminate information and, and to um, uh, receive in, uh, input from all of your stakeholders. So um, Steve's going to talk about the DSO implementation plan. We have a webinar um, for stakeholders on the 16th of July. So in the slides, there's a link for registration for that webinar. Uh, so you can have a more detailed run through in, in that session on the 16th of July. Uh, we also have uh, a web have a webinar on interactivity, which is another area of development in our workstream too. That's on the 20th of July. Again, the link's in here. I mentioned the Community Energy Forums. We're still to confirm the dates on that, but we are looking at uh, July, August for, for Community Energy Forums and, and uh, just looking at the timing for those at the moment. And we have uh, two webinars for the flexibility consultation. That's obviously a, a key publication for us. Uh, we have got those two dates out in advance so people can get them in, the di in their um, diary uh, and please do register for those. A couple of um, associated energy ENA e e innovation events. There's Innovation Forum on the 24th of June. And again, you can uh, register to, to attend there. And we are looking uh, at a, a timing of a webinar for the data working group. I don't know if we have that in the diary now, um, apologies, uh, but uh, we are looking at a more uh, public um, dissemination of our work under the data working group. Dan, maybe if we can um, just pick up on um, anything on the data working group dates or the community energy forum and, and let the advisory group know as and when we have them. Yep, of course. Great, thank you. <clears throat> Go to the next slide. I was about to say, I think that's me for um, a quick run through on things. Uh, I'll just pause for 30 seconds just if there's any feedback on, on that quick run through. Um, if not, maybe we could, I can um, pick up later if there are any other questions on, on my bit or the update uh, through chat later. So thank you um, for listening to that. Hopefully that was a useful update for you all. Um, and I'm now going to hand over to Steve Atkins to run through the uh, where we are with the DSO implementation plan. Thanks, Steve. Thank you, Jason. Um... Yeah, I'm Steve Atkins. I'm uh, DSO uh, Strategy Manager for um, Scottish and Southern Electricity Networks, uh, and I'm also for uh, Workstream 3 uh, DSO Transition. So um, just wanted to um, give a quick update on um, a product that's uh, gone live today, the DSO Implementation Plan, which has been a, a, a key deliverable for Workstream 3. Uh, this uh, for the first half of the, this year um, and uh, just to give you a flavor of uh, where it's come from what it's looking to achieve and um, as you'll be able to kind of uh, play around with it later once once the meeting's finished um, a flavor for uh, of you know what you're looking at and what what it displays um, <clears throat> So the roadmap's been, as I said, it's been prepared under Workstream 3 of the Open Networks. Uh, and the idea is to provide visibility of actions undertaken by all of the electricity networks and, and system operators to deliver distribution system operation um, and net zero uh, ready networks capable of supporting the transformation of, uh, of the en energy systems to a, uh, a smarter grid, uh, a future low carbon economy and, and UK's uh, net zero targets. Uh, and the purpose of the roadmap is to provide insights into uh, DSO functional functionality that's already implemented to date. Uh, as well as anticipated windows for future implementation. Um, and that reflects currently planned activities for network companies um, along the pathway identified in the conclusions to the Future Worlds Impact Assessment Consultation, uh, which allows for future changes to roles uh, and responsibilities of um, distribution network operators in particular uh, to deliver the most effective future uh, DSO. 
Uh, and this version of the, the DSO implementation plan reflects the, the position, uh, the date that the information was gathered, gathered for this publication, which is May 20. Uh, but that will change as development plans adapt and, and new steps and actions are expected. Uh, and they'll be included in the next publication of the roadmap, uh, which is scheduled for uh, Q1 2021. Uh, and there'll be regular updates uh, after that. You'll see that, that some steps are at a primary development stage with unknown uh, implementation dates. And, and as we get closer to some of those areas, uh, then the timeline of those steps will be included in, in the updates as they uh, become available. Uh, in terms of navigation of this uh, this roadmap, the the, uh, the online tool uh, that we're publishing today provides three views of of the roadmap with increased level level of detail. So uh, initially, a roadmap view, and that that displays all of the eight functions that we see as uh, as key in delivering um, distribution system operation. Uh, and that were agreed with uh, with uh, the advisory group and stakeholders uh, early in the the process of uh, the open networks project. Uh, the next level is a, a function is all of the activities within within a particular function, uh, and then uh, drilling down again an view. Uh, which displays all of the steps uh, within a particular activity uh, within a function and, and progress monitoring information if available. So you'll understand that over, <clears throat> you know, over the period of open networks, on some areas we've given very specific uh, progress monitoring for uh, for DNOs and achieving certain areas, and all of that's been retained. So there's there's not hasn't been any any loss of, uh, of visibility. And to navigate across the different views, you'll just select the desired view at the at the top of the the page. Um, and in each view, uh, additional information about the function, about the activity, or or the step uh, will be provided by hovering or or clicking on the uh, on the relevant bar. Uh, and you'll also be able to uh, select a time frame, um, so short term, which is kind of two months to two years ahead. Uh, medium term, which is uh, from last year to five years ahead, uh, and long term, which goes to the to the end of the last re reported uh, reported step. Um, the earliest date that's shown is uh, the first of January uh, twenty twenty, um, and uh, and that's just you know a, a function of the tool in terms of uh, pulling pulling that uh, that together. Um, Within the within the tool as well, you can you can jump from fun functions to activities. Uh, there's drop down box at, uh, at the right hand side of the of the page, and that uh, 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 you can select any of the functions and any of the activities within that, um, and that will give you uh, detailed information. Um, and when you go into the pop up windows that you, you'll see on there. Um, it shows the purpose of the function and the activity as defined by open networks, uh, the implementation period uh, based on the current data, uh, the unique, uh, there's some unique steps as well. So some some steps that are unique to um, particular uh, particular organisations or a group of organisations, um, also uh, unique contributions by participating organisations that are doing uh, particular projects, for example. Um, a progress uh, chart that, that, that displays uh, the kind of overview of the implementation states uh, status of all the steps um, and a perceived complexity uh, in terms of uh, the reported complexity around uh, those things because uh, you know some of them are you know, relatively simple to implement but others um, uh, might be higher complexity because of yeah, <clears throat> particular IT uh, or OT spend. Um, and then the progress of each steps reported at a, a, a number of levels. So um, uh, run from not, not currently planned for implementation uh, through to completed. Um, and it, that just kind of indicates you know, where we are with, uh, with each, each particular, um, particular step. And the definition of uh, all of those fields can be found uh, in the uh, implementation uh, plan document that, uh, that sits alongside um, <clears throat> sit alongside that, um, and that will give you uh, information on all of the steps, all of the definitions, uh, and can support that uh, as well. Uh, as I said, there's, uh, as Jason said, there's a webinar on the 16th of July, uh, 2020, um, from uh, 3 to uh, 4 p.m. 
uh, please uh, register to attend that to uh, get more insight and that will be um, hosted with uh, DMV um, GL who helped build, build the tool. Um, and there's also a uh, video as well um, that's, uh, that will be available on the, uh, the website to, um, to support that. Uh, but the best thing to do is uh, uh, at the end of this meeting, and only at the end of this meeting, because it's not not launched till then, uh, go ahead, go away, have a play with it. It sits under um, the Workstream 3 tab on the, the uh, Open Networks page, um, DSO implementation plan, uh, and have a look at uh, the wealth of uh, information that's uh, that's there. I'll just wait to see if there's any uh, Comments. I'll just uh, just go across to that to uh, let's see if we've got any. I don't know, Dan. If you can see them, is there any uh, anything to respond to? Nothing's come in at the moment. Okay. Okay. I think if that's. Um, <clears throat> If people are happy with that, as I said, uh, have a play with the tool. Uh, we'd be we would um, uh, relish feedback on uh, on that uh, for future iter iterations. Um, but uh, hopefully that will give you uh, good visibility of everything that we're that we're doing within Open Networks and um, when some of these things are, are scheduled to land. Uh, I think at this point I'll hand over to uh, Fiona. Hi, thanks, Steve. So, uh, good morning. Um, you, some of you may already know me, but my name's uh, Fiona Navesy, and I recently joined the ENA Open Networks project. I've I've got over thirty years in the industry with British Gas, Centrica, and a couple of years at uh, DEC. Um, so, my past experience has been uh, mostly about the retail and upstream wholesale markets and, and network policy development. So um, I'm hoping to be able to use that knowledge and stakeholder insight to to uh, support the, the the program going forward. Um, so one of the areas I've picked up is the conflict of interest and unintended consequences register. And um, today I'd like to just give you an update on what's happened with the current register. Uh, discuss some proposals to change. And and gather your feedback either today in the chat or um, after the after the meeting, or you can contact me directly. We can arrange that. Um, so th thanks, Dan, for the the next slide. Um, I thought it might be useful just to do a very brief uh, recap. So this register builds on the work that Baringa uh, did for the Open Networks project with stakeholders back in 2019, and the the aim of the product is to try and capture all the unintended consequences or conflicts of interest that um, uh, arise as a result of, of this program and, and sort of the wider transition. Um, the intention is that the, the, these issues are captured and then that facilitates further exploration. We can identify mitigating actions and then track and update the actions to inform either the DSL design work or other work streams or, or the industry. So in terms of process, this slide sort of gives you a, an overview. I, I won't go through every single line, but essentially the information is taken from a number of sources. So either directly into the program or through a number of channels. So the updates that we've done recently have, have come from the PID 2020 responses, uh, pro progress in, in the work streams, um, progress outside of the work streams in industry, and of course the advisory group and the stakeholder feedback. So the information is collated and reviewed regularly and this um, uh, today I'm sort of releasing the the June update which is the uh, obviously the box that's been circled. Um, I would also like to mention or flag that whilst this has been released in June there's going to be a more substantial update in August and I'm going to cover that in the in the next couple of slides. So if you could give me the next slide, please, Dan. So if I just cover up what's gone on in, in into the June update. So the last time it was uh, updated uh, in, in a major sense was back in November. Um, the register for June is now on the website for you to review and feed in. 
Um, there's a number of changes, and I'll just focus here on, on three of the main ones. Uh, and in particular, I'd like to flag that there are three new unintended consequences. So we haven't got time here to go through them in, 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 in full detail, but I'll just provide a bit of context and headlines for those. So the sources for the change came from two areas, uh, one being the, the 2019 market rules simulations that were developed as part of the uh, transition and Leo projects. And also uh, the feedback that came in through the, the, the PID, 2020 PID. And the two areas that have seen changes is first one is system security, where there is a concern that uncoordinated or untested new markets approaches that are that are being implemented will will somehow reduce system security. And the second one is about how do you treat uh, unplanned benefits to the DNO from uh, as an example a peer to peer trade. So. A situation could arise that normally would have uh, required the, the the ESO or the DSO to procure a market response, but as a result of a peer-to-peer -peer exchange, that activity might inadvertently uh, mitigate that need and provide value to the DSO, but it, without um, any provision to the to, to the, the trade going on at peer-to-peer -peer level. So technically, not an issue, but economically, is it fair? So. That's one of the areas that we've been asked to look at. And the third one is within the area of market power and gaming. So this one was really about uh, a concern that an unintended consequence of trying to lock down the market design and the rules to prevent min uh, market manipulation and gaming could be so strict or prescriptive that it would limit the opportunity for innovation across the markets or deter smaller players. So, so that's another one that will get added to the register for us, us to um, review and, and identify actions to, to come out of the back of that. So I'd really urge you to think about these areas uh, and, and feedback your ideas on, on a few areas really, on, on materiality, so how likely are these, what is the impact and how best to mitigate. Obviously. I'm going to be doing the same at this end, but it, it, it's good to be able to work with the work stream owners and to work with stakeholders to get a, a balanced view of, of, of these particular issues. Um, so I'll leave the, the June update there. Uh, Dan, can you take the next slide? So for the rest of this slot, I really wanted to discuss next steps and, and uh, a major update that we're considering for, for August. Um, and it really is subject to your feedback on, on what we do next. So, um, as I said, I recently joined and having re reviewed the register and spoken to a, a couple of stakeholders, both within the programme and um, with industry, um, we felt that a refresh um, is possibly due and not necessarily of, of the content per se, but more of a, an opportunity to focus on how the register is being used. Uh, improving its accessibility and, and thereby uh, improving the content and the updates. So, you know, one of the observations has been whilst the, the, the register's got, it's rich in information, there's lots of good detail in there. How usable is it in practice? Um, do, you, do you review it regularly? Uh, if not, why not? Um, some comments have come back that well there's, there's there's no overarching summary so it's quite difficult to assess whether the overall position uh, is, is 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 improving um or to be able to review specific uh, progress or updates efficiently it's you know it's you need, required to troll through the spreadsheet to find the information that you need it's not uh, another comment's been it's not always obvious if something has changed um or um if it has to understand why it's changed and where to look and uh finally that you know if if we could make it easier or more intuitive to use then um, we would get better engagement uh, from stakeholders and the risk owners and and therefore in we would get um uh, better updates and content so we've come up with a, a few suggestions for your consideration and um subject to to stakeholders thinking these are uh, reasonably good ideas um these are 
some of the things we're considering. So uh, unsurprisingly, <laughs> given what I've just said, um, including some kind of overarching dashboard or heat map. So a more visual uh, interpretation of whether things are improving or not. And if they're not, where to focus. Um, adding simple things like a, a status column. So uh, you can go in and quickly see where something's changed or there's a new risk that you that you may want to review. Um, and uh, improvements to the scorecard that's in there at the moment. So we can highlight movements. You, so there's a, a visual that says, so okay, we've got all these, these um, unintended consequences and uh, uh, conflicts of interest. You know, are they moving from initiation to closure, or are we are we getting stuck bogged down in the middle? Um, and uh, finally, we'd like to align more with the DSO implementation plan that Steve's just discussed. So, using the same language, using the same status definitions, um, so that they complement each other and 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 they sort of go hand in hand. And and finally, sorry, the last one is. Um, engaging the risk holders more frequently so if 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 we can make this more efficient to use then engaging the risk owners more frequently and getting more updates into the into the log a register um so next slide dan please so um, that's more or less it from me um to conclude i'd really like your feedback on on those suggestions and in particular um we've uh, out four questions here so in reviewing the the actual register is the content we've got there uh, right um does it um you know some of you have, have, have raised gaps or identified issues in the pid are we, are we adequately covering those um how can we improve the risk engagement and reporting so how do we make it easier to get uh, to engage with the spreadsheet and find what you want quickly and efficiently um, you know, the ideas I've set out here are just, just a set of ideas of uh, any other suggestions. Um, number three is a, is a more specific one, which is about uh, uh, so that going beyond just aligning with the DSO implementation plan, but looking at the transition timeline and whether using a phased approach with the with the register would would help resolution of, of some of the issues or whether that just creates a, another unnecessary level of detail. Maybe that's one for, for a longer discussion. And finally, you know, any other suggestions you have in, in ways that we could optimise the information and improve stakeholder and, and risk on interaction. So that was a bit of a, a whistle top <laughs> uh, uh, tour through where we've got to with the register and the plans for the August release. Um, so I'd really appreciate your feedback. I, I anticipate that maybe a big ask to try and get lots of comments here, but um, yeah. I'm, I'm more than happy to touch base after the event um, and, and have a dialogue on on things that you find that you like about it, things that you don't, and, and other other options for improving it. Thank you. So I think I'm handing over to Ben now. Thanks, Fiona. Hopefully, uh, hopefully you can hear me. Um, so I'm uh, Ben Godfrey from WPD. I'm going to be taking you through the um, uh, output from the two, 2019 Workstream 1 AP5 material, which is on uh, flexible connections, uh, specifically those which um, are implemented through active network management um, and their interactions with uh, flexibility services. So um, the outputs of this particular um, product has really been focusing on the uh, conflict management and co-optimization of flexibility services. Um, so understanding how uh, different services um, from both uh, ESO, DSO um, uh, are um, able to coexist um, and, and uh, how they work and uh, ensuring that there are no conflicts of interests or barriers to participation um, from flexibility by um, all the different types of um, uh, arrangements that we use flexibility on the network. And there are three key outputs of this particular report. Um, one of them was looking at the conflict um, management and co-optimization. So this is where we can, uh, techniques for how we can identify 
how conflict might be occurring on the system and then how we might manage those uh, potential conflicts. So what kind of information needs to be shared, which uh, implement, uh, mitigation techniques uh, can be used to uh, avoid or minimize uh, that level of conflict and, and how we can take that forward into implementation um, uh, across uh, DSO and ESOs. We've also looked at the stackability of the DSO services. So um, there's a whole range of um, traditional ESO services and they are being managed through the, um, the SNAPS process, the system um, needs and uh, product strategy from the ESO. Uh, but how do DSO revenue streams um, stack up? Are they uh, able to be used in um, uh, adjacent time periods or in concurrent time periods? Um, uh, so uh, a very detailed uh, and good report has been created to explain uh, which services can be um, uh, added together, which can be used from uh, delivered via the same asset, but in different time periods. And uh, hopefully this report should be able to uh, inform flexibility participants uh, about the compatibility between different revenue streams. Uh, and then finally, we've got this um, interactions between flexible connections and flexible uh, flexibility services. Uh, so ensuring, uh, explaining their approaches and ensuring we've got a, a future pathway um, for uh, complementary actions between those uh, two different uh, forms of flexibility. Okay, next slide uh, is looking at the um, size and scale of um, uh, a and connections and, and flexibility services. So uh, A&M uh, and Flexible Connections has been um, operating on the networks now for quite a significant number of years, um, probably in the region of um, seven to eight years and um, uh, they've grown to a significant size so at the moment at the end of 2019 we had just over three gigawatts worth of uh, uh, con uh, flexible connections and AM connections uh, across um, all the different dnos um, so it's a mature technology um, and it's generally focused at getting um, distributed energy resources connected to the network quicker and cheaper uh, avoiding costs to those connecting uh, customers uh, whilst ensuring that the network can still operate. Uh, conversely, we have uh, flexibility services, uh, which are now being offered uh, by all the DNOs. Uh, these are really seeking to uh, minimize um, the amount of uh, uh, reinforcement required by networks to meet some of the load um, conditions on the network. And um, we're expecting these to grow as we start progressing towards net zero. Um, a smarter, more flexible energy system is very important. And this is one of the key ways that DNO is going to be accessing these services through these contractual mechanisms. Um, lots of tenders have been uh, uh, completed in this area. Uh, but at the moment, it's still quite a small um, market for delivery. Um, and uh, across the DNOs, by the end of 2019, we had uh, only 160 megawatts um, contracted um, to meet those meet those uh, commercial obligations. The next slide um, looks at the differences between uh, and similarities between um, the, the flexible connections delivered through A&M and the flexibility services. So the flexible connections uh, are typically automated. Um, the uh, dispatch of the curtailment is controlled by DNO systems. Um, it limits network access, um, and so it's embodied in the connection agreement. Um, but it reduces the cost for that connecting user um, uh, where they're responsible for the costs. Um, so there's a reduction in the upfront costs for connecting to the network. If there is uh, potential for curtailment through the life of the connection. Um, Conversely, we have flexibility services, um, which are um, formed by a commercial agreement between um, a, a voluntary party and, and the DSO. Um, these are dispatched either in real time um, or, or through scheduled, um, in, uh, either directly uh, or through in, intermediary platforms. Uh, they're very much a um, uh, a kind of uh, uh, commercial level or software level agreement um, 
Uh, between parties, there's no physical equipment on site to be able to manage the connection, ensure that there's compliance. It's all baked into a commercial contract. Um, uh, and uh, it's primarily used um, or solely used where the network is responsible for the costs. Um, so where the network thinks that the um, outputs can be delivered by for a quicker, um, for a, a more economic uh, price, um, then uh, conventional reinforcement and flexibility is being used. And it's open for any existing user to partic participate. Uh, and it doesn't require any changes to connection agreements um, or, or um, uh, it doesn't form agreement through a connection agreement. Um, uh, and exists still required though, um, as with any uh, connected user on the network. The next slide is uh, discussing the current arrangements and the future arrangements. So at the moment, um, flexible connections um, are, are important um, for enabling the faster access, um, but require network management. Um, similarly, we have flexibility services um, are um, uh, sought through the through. Uh, um, open tenders uh, and procured uh, via sort of market-based um, mechanisms. Um, and we have uh, some level of um, convergence now uh, between um, uh, both of those uh, arrangements. So um, a and a bit more of a mature technology. Um, uh, lots of work has gone into the past about ensuring we've got standard terms and conditions across a and uh, users across all the networks. Uh, similarly, DSO service flexibility services, uh, the standard terms have been developed under open networks. Um, uh, there's no exclusivity um, clauses pertaining to AM connections. So anyone with an AM connection can participate in DSO flexibility services. Uh, so no barriers. Um, however, there are still some products uh, from the ESO that are incompatible with AM users at present. Um, the main bulk of work that's been completed underneath the, the co-optimization and uh, conflict management piece um, has been that there uh, is no inherent reason why a and users cannot provide uh, flexibility services to the DSO or ancillary services to the ESO. Further study work um, that's required to make sure that the windows that those services are going to be um, uh, delivered in um, aren't going to conflict with uh, any uh, a and curtailment baked into the connection agreement. Um, but that information is is available uh, for either the user or the ESO to um, to review. Um, uh, so there's no inherent reason why they can't participate in those services. But looking towards the future, uh, we we realise that we want to move away from um, mandated um, flexibility. Uh, and onto more market-based solutions. Um, uh, and that really is where DSO flexibility services um, are, are based. So uh, what we want to try and consider into the future is uh, whether any, um, uh, whether any uh, flexibility services or uh, um, whether flexibility services can deliver some of the um, solutions that a and provides at the moment. Uh, and how they might interact. Um, and I think a lot of these questions um, are going to be interactive with Ofgem's uh, SCR and the review of the access arrangements. So what do A&M connections look like under a shallower arrangement? Uh, does that remove the need for, for A&M management? Uh, and can, um, uh, under shallower connection arrangements, can DNO start taking on more of their potential risk and cost um, through some of their flexibility services? The next slide, uh, final slide, uh, is um, looking at some of the potential future work. Um, and I was aware I got a few questions, or I'll, I'll, I'll sum those up in, in the end. But uh, the future work that we're looking um, is to continue some of the work that's already been developed under open networks, um, but bring that forward to uh, a sort of full conclusion. So um, the data inform and information that uh, enable uh, non-DSO platforms to undertake these functions, um, that's been uh, progressed uh, underneath uh, Workstream 1A. Uh, the standardization of um, A&M uh, delivered flexible connections to um, uh, 
uh, to provide uh, flexibility services. Um, there's uh, quite a few pathways open um, at the moment to A&M Connections. Um, yeah, if if uh, too much curtailment is being faced, they can always reapply and uh, pay for the new connection and the associated costs. Uh, or they can continue with the A&M uh, and accept that level of curtailment. Um, but there may be other future considerations such as uh, procuring flexibility either from the DNO um, through third parties or direct trading with peer-to-peer -peer markets to be able to give them more options to firm up that network access. Uh, again, significant um, uh, uh, interaction with the SCR uh, and, um, and who pays for those costs. Uh, big, big outputs there. Um, and then longer term, um, is there uh, a, a way that um, an uh, unconstrained connection can be delivered through flexibility? And is this something that the DNA should be starting to look to offer um, as, as an alternative to the A&M and the, uh, the consequential costs borne by the user? The main ask really for this is to um, to see, uh, you know, are these the right areas where which Open Networks is focusing on? Are there any kind of improvements that we can make either to the, the data around um, uh, active network management and flexibility services? Uh, and um, uh, do we need to provide more of that data or information to support some of the third party delivery techniques um, that, that were discussed on here? Let me just um, pad for a little while while I have a look through uh, uh, through some of these uh, questions here, if, if that's okay. So um, as a question on um, A&M connections and the review, uh, how often they were reviewed. Um, so typically A&M uh, and the, the level of curtailment um, is a, a sort of ongoing discussion um, uh, between the user and uh, the network operator. Um, obviously, um, the uh, network operator isn't um, aware of the cost of curtailment, um, um, uh, but uh, can review the volumes of curtailment um, uh, suffered by the uh, A&M uh, connections. So um, what we're um, uh, delivered under um, Open Networks um, Workstream 1A on um, a uh, common evaluation methodology for looking at active network management, flexibility, and conventional network reinforcement solutions. Um, so the tool that's been developed on there will be able to take um, the curtailment um, from A&M connections. Uh, we'll be able to look at the flexibility options and, and costs um, delivered through DSO flexibility services and the base case of conventional reinforcement um, which are the options there uh, that are either currently employed or, or could be employed um, stack up in terms of uh, so um, uh, some further recommendations to come out of that um, but that is a tool that can be used uh, to be able to ascertain um, which is the best um, course or most economic course of action um, as to how the cost for that is clearly still uh, under the remit of the um, the current arrangements, um, but may have uh, implications uh, following the um, outcome of the VSCR. Um, and another question here, just on um, uh, uh, another question here, just on the um, A A and M um, and uh, how that relates to, to DSO. Um, so uh, I think this is uh, further work um, that we're progressing with Ofgem, uh, a lot of discussion on this at the moment, um, but making sure that um, where flexibility solutions are, um, you, uh, are being delivered, um, then uh, they're done so through open market means and, and not solely through active network management or associated systems. Um, but uh, the, the final package of work being delivered underneath uh, this P5 uh, we'll be um, explaining uh, what uh, the current situation is and um, uh, uh, giving a view to the future about how those systems are developing uh, to make sure that there aren't any conflicts of interest between um, active network management and flexibility services. 
good. I think I'm now holding on, holding on, uh, handing over to uh, uh, Dr. Collar on the uh, Gasco's Green um, section. Morning all. Um, I'm Tom Collar, the Gasco's Green Programme Lead at ENA. Um, thanks for the opportunity to um, let me come and update on Gasco's Green today. I'm going to say a little bit about how we formed the program, um, how it's structured, and then outline some of the deliverables that we're working on. <clears throat> Can we go on to the first slide, please, Dan? So as most of you will be aware, ENA and its gas network companies have been um, supporting greening of the gas grid for many years now, um, with more than 100 biomethane connections. Um, We've also been taking forward other work to ensure the long-term role of low carbon gases in the round. So that's including um, practical trials of hydrogen blending, um, developing dedicated hydrogen networks, and um, supporting other technologies. Um, so biosynthetic gas production and hybrid heating systems. And we formed Gas Goes Green to really to build on these successes and to put forward a, an integrated plan for the gas networks that sets out the role that we see them having in delivering net zero. And the program is a joint initiative between ENA, um, National Grid, Caden, Northern Gas Networks, SGN and Wales and West Utilities. Through the program, we're bringing together um, the expertise of the gas network companies with the, the wider energy industry, um, policymakers, academics, to make the, the changes that we see necessary to move the, the network from its methane-based um, natural gas that it is today to um, zero carbon hydrogen and biomethane. So before I update on, on Gasco's Green and its deliverables, I first wanted to say a word about um, how the program of work was determined and then explain where um, Gasco's Green sits in ENA. Um, thanks, Dan. Uh, so with this chart, you can see the changing composition of, of the gas that's being transported and distributed through the networks according to our vision out to 2050. Uh, a decline in the natural gas that was received by end users and an increase in, in hydrogen and biomethane. And this view and um, the Gas Goes Green program more widely was informed uh, from a project we ran last year to determine the role that gas can play in meeting net zero across um, buildings, industry, transport and power sectors. And this, the report from this, this project that was undertaken by, by Guidehouse determines a viable, a viable pathway to um, 2050, one that's compliant with the net zero target. The report describes in detail the six stages to the pathway that you can see outlined at the top of that chart, um, the pathway that's required to, to take us on, on that uh, journey to 2050. I don't propose to, to cover the, the different steps of that pathway today, but I'm happy to take questions on that, or if anyone wants to know more, um, they can drop me a line. Um, in terms of that pathway, um, gas, of course, has important implications for electricity and electricity networks, and the pathway itself is one that certainly recognises um, the, the interrelationship between gas and electricity and adopts what the report terms a balanced energy scenario. And this optimal path has, has four critical elements. Um, so low carbon and renewable gas, uh, so that's biomethane from AD, from thermal gasification, hydrogen from reformation and from electrolysis, along with continued electrification. Um, and then importantly, development of um, CCS and energy efficiency measures. If we can move on to the next slide, Dan. So as well as the pathway, the report, um, and indeed from, from conversations with stakeholders that we engaged during the research, the, the report in that project identified uh, a number of low regret actions that the gas network operators should be taking to enable progress on that pathway to be met. And really this informed the, the Gas Goes Green scope of work for this year that's been allocated across six work streams. So the first work stream, investing in net zero, 
um, deliverables in this work stream are examining the, the role gas networks have in um, delivering the, the cost optimal route to a net zero future in this balanced energy system that I described. The second work stream on gas quality and safety is focusing on work that's required to ensure the safe transportation and distribution of, of hydrogen and biomethane. And I'll update in a, in a, in a minute or two on the, the current work we've got there on regulatory changes that we see as being required. On consumer options, um, deliverables in, in this work stream are, are looking at the implications of, um, of net zero gases on different consumer groups. So we have a, a piece of work that's looking at uh, transition pathways for heavy goods vehicles. The system enhancement work stream number four is looking at revising network equipment and um, network processes to facilitate um, net zero networks and, and indeed their smart operation. Uh, deliverables for Workstream 5 on hydrogen transformation are looking at um, how we would transition to um, a, a hydrogen system. And with Workstream 6, um, we are working to receive feedback on the program and its um, discrete deliverables and, and engage more widely on some of the environmental, economic and social benefits of a decarbonised gas grid. So that's sort of what the programme looks like. On the next slide, um, you can see how Gas Goes Green is aligned with open networks. And as you can see from here, um, there are several interfaces and these will be further strengthened as, as Gas Goes Green um, further develops. So as Jason mentioned, um, at ENA, we see that having a, a whole systems approach is vital for both Gas Goes Green and Open Networks, and our um, respective uh, advisory groups have, have cross-vector membership. Both projects are also feeding into our data working group, which is looking at ways of modernising energy data. And there will be alignment between our, our project deliverables and joint positions that help both electricity and gas network companies um, make progress towards achieving net zero. So I've said a little bit about the, the challenge that Gas Goes Green is responding to, um, how it came about and how it's structured. On the next slide, you can see the deliverables that we have for 2020. So I'm not going to detail all of these um, for time reasons. You can, you can read more about um, each of these deliverables in the, um, the programme documentation on the ENA website or, or give me a call, happy to discuss anything in more detail. But to highlight some of the upcoming work, um, so we have some upcoming engagement to develop the, the evidence base for changes that we see as being required to the gas safety management regulations. Um, so work is underway to see about moving part of the uh, part of the legislation out of legislation and to an industry standard to give it more flexibility, um, which is something we see as one of the first of a few steps that are required to, um, to translate the gas safety management regulations and indeed the calculation of thermal energy regulations into uh, a set of instruments and, and guidance that will enable a wider range of gases to be injected and indeed um, appropriately build. Also coming up, um, we have a, sh a short piece of analysis um, that's being finalised currently looking at reductions in leakage emissions from, um, from across the different um, gas distribution networks. We also have um, some work coming forward on um, local, regional and national pathway studies. And these really are looking to add granularity um, to the high level pathway study that um, that really kicked off this, this programme of work. And also over the next couple of months, um, we're developing a detailed hydrogen transformation plan for the networks. Um, whilst I'm here talking to you all, I was actually um, thinking it's a good opportunity to get um, 
to get views we might you might have um, from experience on the electricity network side on um, grid capacity options so we have work underway uh, and being taken taken forward through the gas goes green program on um, standardizing the connection process for distributed gas entry and we have a, a gas innovation uh, project called Optinet that's trialing um, smart pressure controls on the network and compression from the network to higher pressure tiers uh, and indeed looking at storage solutions. But I, I, I wonder in this, um, uh, ben, ben was speaking to, to, to something uh, to this extent earlier, I wonder if anyone on the call today may have reflections on perhaps um, balancing or pri priority dispatch um, experiences on the electricity network or from the flexibility services work that's ongoing that the gas networks could learn from or perhaps um, experiences of um, how you've used data um, perhaps heat maps uh, for new connections um, to further support um, new new connections coming forward um, so if there is time for some some q a um, interested to, to hear some thoughts on that. And the final thing on the next slide I just wanted to draw your attention to um, is two reports that were published in the last few weeks. Um, so on the left there, um, our zero carbon commitment. Um, so that's setting out the, the network plans for investment in, in Rio 2. And the second report our uh, hydrogen cost to consumer research. This is um, making um, really making the point that whilst both blue and green hydrogen are required to meet UK's energy needs, um, blue hydrogen can really act as a vehicle for uh, accelerating green hydrogen production, and indeed for uh, for leading to um, lower costs in the in the long run. And on the final slide is um, just a, a note to say thank you. Uh, my contact details are there. And if you are interested in project updates, um, do drop Gas Goes Green uh, a line and um, we look forward to hearing from you. If, if uh, there's no questions, I've tried, to prompt, I've tried to prompt Tom, so I've dropped a note out all to participants if there if there's anything off your your particular question as well. So we'll just give a, a minute or so. Any any other items you might particularly want some feedback on, Tom, before I pick up from here? I think that was the the main one at, at this stage. Um, just to return to the to the other point that um, we see it as very important that um, gas goes green and open networks have have strong relationships. So um, where other opportunities for for input or um, where we feel we can we can benefit from expertise on the electricity network side and and open network stakeholders that will be um, keen to to get your thoughts um, throughout the year. Uh, so on Steve's question, Steve Atkins has asked whether there was any independent input into the gas goes green scenarios. Um, so yes, there was, um, I think about 70 stakeholders um, uh, over the course of three workshops um, were, were engaged and, and their ideas fed into the scenarios that, um, that informed the, the Navigant report. Um, which we're sort of um, using to determine our, our, our vision for how things are proceeding with Gas Goes Green. And that's views sort of up, upstream and downstream of the gas networks. Thank you. So if there's no other questions, I'll pass back to Jason, but thanks again. Thanks, Tom. Um, 
as as I said at the beginning, as as, as Tom said in in his presentation, we'll have a regular slot on on Gas Goes Green because it is important for us to make use of each other's uh, advisory groups and and make sure we have that whole energy systems thinking um, in in all of our minds and all of our development work. So. Uh, thank you for that, Tom. Um, I've dropped a note to Dan as well. If there are any specific questions um, for us to send out to advisory group, we'll do that via correspondence as well. So, thank you. Um, uh, back back to me again, and um, I, I know the presentation in between uh, now and and you all having a break. So uh, I'm conscious of that. We are on time. So I've got a, I've only got a couple of slides to run through on the flexibility consultation at the moment. Uh, Dan, if you move on to the next slide, uh, because as I said earlier, this is still in drafting. Uh, we are still on target for publication in July, although I would say it is very tight. Um, uh, not least of which we, you know, we we are uh, looking at how we consolidate all the content we've got across all of our work and, and how we present that in a sensible set of questions for you all to provide input. Um, Ben's run through some of the work around stackability. That's an area of particular uh, attention for us and we're thinking about how we might um, uh, ask the most appropriate questions to, to get the sort of feedback that Graham and Helen were giving earlier via the Q&A. Uh, because that is the sort of um, challenge that we want to encourage. So, so it is in drafting, and actually one of the things I wanted to do today is, is do a bit of prompting here on the Q&A, hopefully, a um, bit, of, bit of engagement um, uh, to see where you think we might be targeting questions against, against all of our products. So we, we do want to encourage um, as much feedback as possible. I've got a generic question that we're going to ask across all of our development output, which I've got on the slide here, which is a, a sort of normal and, and fairly standard consultation question. Uh, we are looking to make proposals wherever we can within our output. And that is definitely not to say that um, that options are closed out. But what we found in our consultation papers to date is if we make proposals rather than ask open questions, then we can move forward more quickly and it generates uh, a better strength of feedback from, from consultees. Because if you ask an open question, you then have to uh, um, make proposals and go through consultation again. And one of the reasons why we have this advisory group and our stakeholder engagement is to get that input through our development process. So um, we are working on the basis that we have a good, strong level of input from participants through our advisory group engagement. And, and our discussion with stakeholders. Uh, we're making proposals in our flexibility consultation where we can, and then we're seeking feedback on, on, on those proposals so we can move forward into implementation. And the challenge always with open networks from, from government and, and from Ofgem is, um, yeah, we love what you're doing, but um, uh, please do more and move faster. Uh, and, and we're trying to ensure that we keep pace on development whilst ensuring we're taking people's um, views into account as we go and ensuring that we go to public consultation for those areas that are particular interest, particular contention, or where there are multiple options. And flexibility is, is all of those things. And what we're doing in our consultation paper is we are doing the same thing we did last year, uh, which we thought worked quite well, but again, I'm very happy to take your feedback on your views on how that worked. Um, we're going to do a cut across all of our products and outputs from the flexibility work stream and drop that out for consultation. So we're not doing it on a particular product or a particular area. We're going to cut all the way across all of our development work and flexibility because we think that gives you the best opportunity to respond. And you can see how all of the moving parts fit together. And I've got a slide um, uh, next that, that, that just shows how all of our products fit together. Um, as with previous consultations, we're, we're happy for you to respond in whatever format and whatever level of detail you have time to respond with. So if you only have a couple of hours to look at our flexibility paper, you know, look at the consultation wrapper, think about the areas that are of particular interest to you and, and drop us an email with some bullets on your views. We're, we have had those as consultation responses and we welcome those. If, 
we would much rather have four or five bullets than, than no feedback if you don't have enough time. Um, uh, on the other side of it, we also get very detailed responses back from some of you as stakeholders against all of our products, against all of the questions, against all of the proposals. And obviously, um, we would love to have that. So we're going to ask that general question and then some more specific questions where relevant and, and picking out specific questions and challenges to the product. So you saw earlier, um, Ben, Ben is looking at um, uh, in, in the uh, trackability work, you know, where else should we be focusing our priorities? So we are looking at how we do that. Um, and, and what I'll do on the next slide is just run through all the products and then hopefully um, you, can, you can have the opportunity to provide any, any feedback on this. We'll also ask a general question on stakeholder engagement as always, just to see how we might better engage and encourage feedback for the future. Okay, so before I move on to the next slide, I've got a question from, from Helen. Will new papers or draft products be published alongside the overarching consultation wrapper? For example, last year, a number of papers came out, including flexibility principles and also the framework for the standard contract. And the answer to that is yes. So we will be publishing all of our papers and reports as they're, as they're ready at the time of consultation. So Dan, that, that's quite a nice link into the next slide, if you wouldn't mind moving on. So um, this, this is a, a, a new diagram of ours, but it, it hopefully helps set some context. I will answer your question again in, in a second, Helen. But this, what, what we've tried to do in this, in this product is going um, from furthest out assessment of future network requirements through to baselining uh, uh, through to dispatch and baselining of flexibility services, showing where our products sit in that timeline of activities as, as networks. Um, so you'll, you'll have a couple of presentations later on the um, uh, DFES and the consistency about uh, future energy scenario work that we're doing, and also the signposting work. So that, that um, future network requirement assessment work will you'll have the opportunity to provide some input later with Hadi and Jill and then the right hand side the green boxes are the products that we're developing under the flexibility work stream and and we will be publishing um, all of the information we have and, and reports and products against all of those products um, as as we have them available in 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 July so we have dropped um, some of our Workstream 1A products out um, in, in earlier on this year. For example, we did have uh, the first draft of the existing approach to procurement under Workstream 1A product 2. But what you'll see published alongside um, the consultation paper is a more detailed view on our procurement processes where we've got to with alignment on procurement processes and standardization of procurement processes. And we've got some specific questions around the timing of pre-qualification activities, because that is a, an issue of particular uh, interest for, um, for stakeholders. And also we've looked to standardize how we evaluate and, and weight uh, evaluation in our bidding process. So we've looked at the weighting between commercial and technical requirements in the bidding process and how we standardize those across um, DNOs for their DSO services. So there is another level of detail on the procurement processes that show how we're proposing to align process. Um, it shows a couple of options for PQQ uh, timing of activities and, and it shows um, a proposal around weighting of bids. So that's a good example of a, a good level of detail below where we've got to previously on the procurement process, and we will be asking out to you uh, for your views on that. And and you know it'll, it's a theme with with Hadi and Jill a bit later. You know, our, our, one of our key drivers through open networks, as as you know, is to drive standardisation um, in order to deliver uh, a more uh, easy engagement for for all of you as as market participants nationwide, particularly for DNO and DSO services in in procurement. So um, the more that we can standardise, the easier it is for you to engage on a consistent way across all of the companies. 
So just an example there, Helen, hopefully that, that answers your question and, and, and looked at what we're doing in the procurement processes. In, I'm going to run through all of them and um, I'll, I'll, I'll just give a bit of commentary, but if you can think of what I want to do here is if you can think of any questions you'd like to ask in these areas or would like us to ask you in these areas, then please do put them on, on the chat and we'll have a look at them um, as a bit of a preemptive strike down. Um, uh, have put them on the chat and, and we, will, we will look to, um, to see how we incorporate them and we'll have a discussion today. So the Workstream 1A product one, you've seen um, some of what we've been doing around the common methodology for valuation of flexibility. And we will be publishing our proposals for the method um, are for evaluation, the, the options assessment we've undertaken and where we have landed with that. So you'll have the opportunity to feedback on that. We will also be publishing the draft tool as well. So um, there is uh, quite a lot of detail underpinning our, our methodology for the evaluation of flexibility and how that feeds into decision making for, for procurement processes. So that is a, a hefty element of, of what we're putting into the um, consultation paper and you'll have the opportunity to provide feedback. Um, as many of you will know, we have commissioned Beringa to do that as an independent piece of work uh, to ensure that we have that level of independence and assurance on, on our proposals in this area, given its importance across all of what we do. On the standard definition uh, of DSO services, uh, we have been looking at further areas to standardize our parameters for DSO services, building on the work done to date on the four active uh, DSO services. So you'll see our proposals um uh a, in a number of different parameters and we'll be just asking for your views against those parameters so uh, there's been some good work and another level of detail there that will be coming out uh stackability of flexibility services so ben has run through that and there'll be some questions associated with that um it was good to see the engagement and that is an area where we are expecting um uh, uh some some good feedback from all of you to feed it through future development. Alex is going to talk about the common contract. We aren't going to be asking any consultation questions around the common contract. Um, we have stakeholder feedback through the exercise we've done on the common contract, and we're currently evaluating how we respond back to that. So Alex is, is going to cover that a bit later, but um, we won't have any specific questions around the common contract because that's been subject to stakeholder review in a different process uh, that we ran earlier so that we could get the feedback earlier. And then the last element is baselining flexibility services. We have a proposal for um, a scope of work to go out with some to some consultants to help us with a uh, uh, common methodology for baselining. And we'll be asking you some questions around um, the scope and activities that we're proposing to take. This is something that we're doing later this year. And then last uh, but not least is we have an interim report on facilitation of non-DSO services that looks across uh, some of the current um, innovation projects, the flex competition from Bayes, uh, and, and, and gives an interim view on where we are with, with support and facilitation of non-DSO services from, from Open Network. So, so Helen, um, in response to your question, the, the actual consultation wrapper itself is the easy bit. Um, that, that, that's why I picked up the drafting for that. I, I, I can do that, the wrapper piece. Um, but really, all of the detail sits in the content of all the individual papers that we will be publishing alongside the, the wrapper. Okay, uh, what else have I got? Yes, and um, at the bottom of this, there's just a bullet just to show some of the other interaction across, across, the, um, across the product. So that was um, that was what I wanted to talk through, really, just to give you a view on what's coming and give you an opportunity to um, to, to to provide an input and feedback on this. Right. Um, uh, just a quick note, Emma Bridge has sent us a note saying that she has to log off. Emma, thank you. And um, it's really important for us, uh, engagement on community energy and uh, the community energy forums upcoming. Thank you for your support on that. So um, 
Uh, I'm glad you found the, the briefings today useful and hopefully we'll we'll catch up with uh, with Randolph over the next few weeks. So thank you for dialing in for the for the first session. Okay, uh, so so Helen, uh, thank you for your your questions. Um, across all the Flex products, please consider how you work for aggregation, including aggregation of small assets. Uh, whether it's not appropriate for individual assets to technically pre-qualify, um, at least not in the same way as large assets. This is something that we're thinking about. Um, so uh, I've been given a challenge internally on how we reflect aggregation um, in our flexibility consultation and how we drop down below sort of um, some of the traditional thresholds for flexibility services and how we um, how we reflect residential flexibility in, in our consultation. So I'm currently thinking about how we reflect uh, residential and small scale businesses in an update into the consultation paper. So Helen, um, it's, it's with me at the moment, but I, I am intending at the moment to put something in around aggregation of small assets. And, and how we reflect that in our um, in our flexibility market developments. So um, if I don't put something in on that, in on that I, I totally expect that to be a comment coming back. But I, I have got a few paragraphs on it. I just need to get it through um, through our approvals process. So yes, that is definitely on our hit list. And now you can hold me to account for it. Now I've said that in there in, in the advisory group. Okay. Anything else from um, anyone else? I realise that um, it's it's you know this is this is a big content driven um, uh, content driven consultation again. Okay, great, uh, Dan. If you can just forward Graham's question, just so everyone can see it. Okay, thanks, Sam. Um, yeah, so Graham's just asked in terms of consultation reach, have we considered links to other business trade associations? Um, uh, and Eddie certainly uh, was on the call earlier. I think he probably still is. Uh, I, um, I'm just having a look at the attendees. So um, yes, uh, we, we have historically reached out to a number of business trade associations for the advisory group. So the in, in energy intensive user group uh, uh, amongst others. Um, Eddie has been uh, Eddie Profit for those who don't know Eddie P from uh, Graham's um, uh, Graham's notes. Um, I, I let me just uh, have a quick. I'm pretty sure Eddie was on the the participant list, but I don't seem to be able to open the full list at the moment. Um, uh, yes, so we have we have engaged with other trade associations. So. The energy intensive user group are on our distribution list for the advisory group. I think, Graham, if there's anyone you have in mind uh, that you think we should be targeting, I'll gratefully receive any um, uh, information, any, any links or or um, uh, contact details for that. Dan has just texted me, say Eddie's online. So uh, um, thank you for your ongoing participation, Eddie. Um, yeah, so Graham, if you could drop me a note with any others that you think it's important for us to target, quite happily, um, quite happily pick that up and, and include it in our distribution list. GDPR um, compliance notwithstanding. Okay. Good. Hopefully that's a, a useful taster of what's to come. Um, we are four minutes ahead of schedule, so I propose to give you four minutes extra for your break. We'll resume the session at 11.10. Everyone's got a chance to stretch their legs a bit, a bit, recharge the batteries, get away from their screens for a few minutes. And then um, Alex will pick up on the commercial arrangements and contract which we flagged up a number of times um during the session so far so hopefully everyone will get a good breather and we'll come back to the session at 10 past 11 thank you
who um, resulted in one DNO opting out to retain their current single cap process based on, on their direct feedback. Um, Dan, if we move forward one, please. So in terms of um, some additional discussion points, you know, just around the, the, the contract cap and the single cap uh, liability options, the single cap liability doesn't consider those differences between um, single uh, small participants or groups of small participants and a large aggregator running multiple assets. Um, we also identify that there is a particular issue in terms of the contract value capping doesn't consider providers working under a single contract across multiple years. So, of course, if we implement a one year contract, that contract value itself will be far, far lower than a four year contract for the same service. So actually the contract length has a direct impact on the contract value and therefore what liabilities or indemnities would be sought through the contract. Um, so that in itself discourages longer term contracts and we know we're as part of the industry that actually longer term contracts are, are attractive to providers because actually there is a, a, a financial confidence that can be implemented in business cases that you've got a four or a five or even some of the, the kind of trial contracts that are now being put out there that are seven or ten years. We also have a difficulty in some of the service types to actually agree what that contract value is. So if we're implementing um, you know, some of the, the fault restoration um, or you know, post fault services, at the onset, we're putting these in just in case we need them. So actually the value of the contract can be estimated maybe based on you know, faults that have been experienced in previous years. However, they may not actually reflect the overall value of the contract once it's been in operation for a period of time. And we may well be asking for liabilities in ex far in excess of the value of the contract after its year of operation. Or adversely, we could well be asking for liabilities that don't reflect the level of risk if there is a more frequent utilization. Um, there is uh, some questions there around um, you know, uh, the annual cap on liability. Um, Oh, if we if we go back one, sorry, Dan, we've we've skipped forward one. Um, so uh, in terms of uh, implementing a, a contract value cap, it could potentially increase liabilities for existing providers that have contracts with DNOs that are already under a capped value. So that was one of the key drivers as to why the DNO that, that opted out of the the contract cap value uh, process. Uh, sorry, the, the yeah, the contract cap value process um, is it could well have resulted in additional costs. Um, there is stakeholder feedback, of course, that, that would suggest that DNO is absorbing these costs and higher risks. Um, there is apparent risk of distorting competition if we were reducing these, even for those providers that were perfectly capable of absorbing higher indemnities. Um, and that, of course, then could potentially lead into gaming and, and ultimately you know, with flexibility services, the key is, is to try and keep this a cost effective solution for customers connecting to or drawing energy from from the, the UK networks. And ultimately, it is a responsible for us, uh, responsibility for us to ensure that we, you know, we do try and keep costs low. So now if we can move forward. Thanks, Dan. Um, so we, we didn't just go to, to, to Bayes and Ofgem with a problem statement. We did, we did go in with, a, with some possible solutions. Um, you know, we've got two tabled uh, solutions that are already in place. There is both the, the contract value and the capped approach. Um, we could look at an annual cap on liability based on charges from the past year with a minimum to apply. Um, and that can then be assessed at the outset based on what our anticipated volumes for the use of that service is. We did mention, of course, that at the moment, you know, there is a, a certain amount of DNO absorbing additional risk already. And of course, reflecting that that might be the best route forward. So we did raise the point that actually, you know, is there, you know, potentially incentives or recoverable investment allowances for DNOs to reflect that, that would actually enable us to, to absorb more of that risk moving forward. We did mention and table the, the potential for a third party to be set up uh, or appointed. To, to support those smaller organizations that maybe were unable to, to field indemnities. But again, we did have to acknowledge that that may well be providing, um, you know, an additional service for smaller providers, which of course might might offset the the, the larger providers you know, or, or you know, encourage feelings of unfairness within the, within the markets. 
in all cases there was that need to ensure that in those in those small cases where there was a bit of disparity between procurement um, capped values and or, or liabilities and uh, contracted the final contract levels is just making sure that there was a linear approach for each of the organizations in in how those were applied um, if you move forward thanks Dan so with Bayes and Offgem, um, you know, and it was a very healthy discussion, there were some very good points, but these were the kind of pullouts, the actions that we've taken forward as a team. So I think it was acknowledged across across the, the, the group that it would be impossible at this point to have a single approach, one single uh, approach to liabilities and indemnities that, that could be implemented. So what we wouldn't do, would, uh, we would do instead was to produce a set of options um, for review and approval, both within the ENA and, and through those ongoing discussions with both an off gem with discussions based on how these would be implemented. So would we, you know, tailor options by service type? Could we, um, you know, provide a set of options that might either be selected uh, by the provider or by the DNO, or would there be a, a mix? Now, the idea being is that we don't want 30 different solutions, is to try and keep these set of solutions quite defined, quite small. So actually there is still uh, confidence from providers that instead of seeing 30 different options, there would only be, you know, potentially one or two different adjustments, maybe three or four. Um, and the P4 team will be building these as part and parcel of our scoped work um, as we move towards version two. And we'll also produce a roadmap um, to ensure that these solutions do drill down into a single solution as soon as it's possible. Maybe as the market evolves and we gain more experience about you know, where these risks are and how they translate into, into those liabilities. So both of those steps will be completed for version two. And of course, they will be subject to, to, to feedback and open to, to points that, that come in from, from um, providers and the advisory group as well. We'll also look to investigate the relationship between risks and the cost for flexibility services. So actually, you know, there was wide acknowledgement that you know, there is a disparity between risk associated with implementing flexibility services on, on you know, static networks versus the, the confidence that's gained by more traditional solutions. Um, we will provide that um, through and hopefully inform how things like policy regulations may change to support both the evolving marketplace and also where that marketplace ends up and um, in normal operation. Um, that covered the, the the update on liabilities and indemnities. And of course, there will be, and just as some of the points that have been raised, um, there, there will be the opportunity for, for stakeholder review before any final um, before any final versions are released. Um, so I know that there was a point of feedback that we'd had previously, um, a feeling of unfairness that you know, actually there wasn't a significant period of feedback before version one was released. That will be taken into account in terms of version two, and we do plan on that. We have collected quite detailed feedback. Um, so thanks to you, to you all that, that responded. Um, the feedback, of course, uh, comments will be coming out over the course of the next couple of weeks. And I do have to apologize if there's any delay. That's my own personal fault. I was off ill for a period of time. Um, but we will be responding to those feedback points. And some of the points that have been raised in the questions already, such as ensuring the fact that um, the approach is open and we're, we're considering how aggregators can engage with both services and the contract itself was a key point of, uh, of some of the feedback that we had. So we will be pushing that forward as well. Um, so in, in terms of the, the presentation, that covers the, the discussion and the problem points that we've had around liabilities and access. Um, and uh, if, if everybody's happy, we'll, we'll go to a few of the questions now. So um, I can already see that we've that we've had a point here from from um, Graham Dawson. So thanks thanks for that point. So from experience, client feedback and wider clauses are still considered unpalatable and a barrier to customers. Not insurmountable, but as they stand, supply aggregated business would not sign in, and there would for there would be an impact to INC customers. So. Um, and I think that goes into, you know, name party on insurance policies. Most will not permit free and unrestricted access rights. Um, so there were a number of points within the feedback where there were either specific glossary terms or clauses that might be considered a, a continued barrier, much as the, the existing or historical contracts may have had issues. 
Um, so the aggregated point, as I said, is, is one that we do take very, very seriously. We will ensure the fact that within version two, there are suitable adjustments made to um, you know, make sure there is a bit of a level playing field either between individual providers and aggregators. Um, and, I, and I think, Graham, what would be really useful if, if you've not done already is, of course, I'll, I'll lift this detail and, and take it away into the feedback. But some of those individual clauses will be um, you know, reviewed and we'll take the feedback in and where, where we're able to, we'll rewrite things to make sure that actually they do become more palatable for, for, for people moving forward. Um, just going through just to see if there's any other questions. Um, I, ha I can't see any other questions uh, with regards to, to this segment at the moment. So um, please do feel free over the next minute or two if you do have additional questions just to, to, to pop them down. We've, we've got a couple of minutes just to pause, um, Alex. Um, we're a little ahead of schedule, but um, well. Yeah, poly apologies. Num number of coffees today, Jason. So I, th I sorry everybody if I've been speaking very, very quickly. <laughs> I think I think you've covered a, a lot of material in 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 a good time now. I think it's been a, a good heartbeat of information. Very polite way of saying that I might have shell shocked people. <laughs> Well, I think I think you've got a lot of people on the call who have uh, provided feedback on on the contract terms as well through the stakeholder engagement. Indeed, so, yeah. Um, so yeah, I think I think Alex, maybe we we'll wrap it up there. And um, and again, uh, Graham, I know that you've engaged on 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 the contract anyway. But uh, any any questions or comments? You know, we are uh, reviewing the the feedback. Um, if, if people do have further feedback, we can't guarantee we can take it into account given the windows closed, but any feedback genuinely gratefully received um, and, and we will try to consider um, whatever we can through this process. And, you know, the, the, the challenges lie ahead with this product now that we're starting to look at um, uh, consolidation with, with the ESO services as well. So Alex has got his hands full over the next few months looking at taking forward the, the the release two of the contract, not just with with uh, your comments, but also looking at how we we, we look to get some standardization with ESO services as well. So it's um it's a key part of, of, of our development work for the rest of this year, as you know. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Jason. Thank you all. I think I think we hand hand over to Hadi now. Um, uh, hi everybody, um, I'm Hadi Khuzani from SSC Networks and the product lead for uh, WorkStream 1B Product 2. Uh, the presentation is to update you basically on the work that we have done on DFS uh, uh, standardizations and seek your feedback and views on the work. Uh, let's start with a little bit of background about future uh, distribution future energy scenarios. So basically similar to what we have with FES, DFES is a set of uh, credible scenarios to forecast demand and generation growth, but at the regional levels. So basically uh, the DFES is to inform customers and stakeholders about the direction of the networks and future plannings and update them on that work. We believe that uh, standardization in in DFES, it provide consistency in a way that all DNFs are doing their uh, basically forecast for generation and demand, as well as uh, basically identifying networks need and reinforcement for future. And this consistency makes things easier for the stakeholder to understand and compare results from different DNOs. Next slide, please, Dan. So basically, more or less, all DNOs have the same process for DFS publications. They all start with defining scenarios and the framework for the work. Then they obtain volumes for different demand and technologies, uh, mostly based on building blocks. And using their own profiles, they convert these volumes to megawatt forecasts for generations and demand. And these megawatt forecasts later use in their studies to identify networks needs and constraints and finally publications. The first three steps uh, was part of the product two, and it will be covered in these presentations. And the last two parts will be part of product five, which will be 
which will be covered in the next presentation by Jill. Next slide, please. So basically, when we started this work, we identified five main objectives. I tried to go over those objectives briefly, and in following slides, I will explain them in details. So the first objective was to make sure that all DNOs have the same high-level process for their defense publications. The objective was well, the objective B was to identify a common process for defense standardizations. Objective C was to identify those elements such as assumptions, profiles, and limits that could be subject to standardizations. We also have to adopt a common time frame and process for each cycle of phase and defense. And finally, we had to identify a mechanism so we should be able to update our tools, assumptions, and process at the end of each cycle. So next, next slide, please. Now. As I touched briefly on it in the in the backgrounds, uh, all DNOs are they have similar process for defense publications. They start with defining the scenarios. Usually, it's two by two matrix similar to FES. They capture the regional cross and they convert them to building a specific building blocks that has been agreed between all DNOs. And those building blocks will be converted to a megawatt forecast for generations and demand, and it will be used for studies and later publications. So all DNOs are on the same page on this process. Next slide, please. So when we wanted to discuss and come up with a process for the standardizations, we set up a list of criteria that we need to have for, for that process. First of all, us, it should give us opportunity to check our assumptions if there is any significant difference between national grid trends and license area trends or between different DNOs. It should provide a feedback, feedback loop that allows us to debate and update our data models and the forecast. It also should provide enough flexibility to the DNOs to engage with local stakeholders and capture local ambitions and targets in their forecasts. And finally, considering the extent of the work, it should be achievable and basically provide the foundation for further standardization in future if it's required. And next slide, Dan. Thank you. So, Basically, uh, we propose three different uh, approaches or processes for the standardizations, and each of them provides different level of standardizations and different level of flexibility for DNOs to engage with local stakeholders. On the first approach, on the left side, basically uh, all DNOs adopt the same scenario framework as national grid phase. This is a two by two matrix and the same scenario names. But the but DNOs have enough flexibility to set up their own assumptions around those scenarios or levers. However, uh, this method is easy because it doesn't require additional resources, but it could lead to the significant difference between national trends and license area trends. So this process provides the least level of standardization but the highest level of flexibility for DNOs. On the approach that we have on the right side, Basically, we assume that all the processes, framework, assumptions, in details are the same between DNOs and national grids. It requires high level of interactions between uh, national grid and DNOs. This method is quite resource intensive, and it might prevent DNOs from capturing and reflecting local targets and trends. So we came up with the third processes, which we have it here in the middle. And this pro in this process, we provide the highest level of flexibility for DNOs without compromising standardizations. So what we basically have here is that the scenarios and the frameworks are the same as national grids. We also have the high level of the assumptions and levers as national grids. We, we also have a process at the end of each cycle to check the, to check the trends between national grids and DNOs to see if there's any significant difference and if there's any significant difference, we will, uh, we will check the assumptions and the models, and we will update them for the next cycle. Uh, this uh, method is also a little bit resource intensive, but not as much as the method that we have on the right side. And next slide, Dan, please. 
So after we establish uh, the process for the standardizations, uh, we had a debate and discussion around what needs to be standardized. The first one was high-level assumptions. Uh, basically, National Grid every year publish an uh, Excel file with, uh, I think it's called PES, uh, PES assumption framework. And last year, it was around seven, over 70 assumptions with different themes, political, economic, uh, social, or uh, customer's behavior. So we will adopt all relevant assumptions, and those assumptions indicate levers such as high, medium, or low for different technologies. The next debate that we had was around profiles. We came to the agreement that profiles are region specific because they depend on the customer's behavior and climate. However, we think there is a benefit to compare and debate profiles adopted by different DNOs. And also, there is a wider benefit to the uh, stakeholders if we publish our profiles in our FES and DFES document. And lastly, we discuss about our baseline demand and generations, which is our starting point for DFES. And we believe uh, the framework that we have by P27 or week 24 can be adopted here as well. Uh, next slide, please, Dan. So at the moment, uh, we, uh, we have a time, timeline for the, for the cooperations between DNOs and national grids, uh, which we have discussions about uh, FES in different touch points. And we believe this timeline can be used for the discussions we will have around the standardizations as well. So at the moment, all DNOs have agreed to publish their defects sometimes between October and December, different days for different DNOs. So this gives us opportunity to compare our results with national grid results sometimes in December and January, and basically update our model if it's required. Later in February, we could have a separate meeting with the national grids to debate and discuss high-level assumptions and levers that will be adopted by national grid for phase 21. These are the same assumptions that all DNOs will also adopt for D phase 21. And later in July, national grid will publish its uh, phase, and the cycle will repeat again for the next year. Uh, if we could move forward that, please. So as, as, as I discussed earlier, so uh, we, we have agreed that we all have the same profile, the same scenarios, and two by two metrics. We will have the same high level assumptions and levers. However, when it comes to the publication, it might be differences between national grid and DNOs for each GSP or each scenario and each year. So we establish a mechanism to review all of those results for different technologies, different year and different GSPs. And if there is a significant differences, we will go to the process to debate them and check models from national grid and the DNOs and provide evidence to see what needs to be done for the next iteration of the FES or DFES. Uh, next slide, please, Dan. So this work has already been presented to Workstream 1B and Open Network Steering Group, and we have obtained their feedback and incorporated them. We are hoping to uh, seek your feedback and views uh, in this presentation or by email later and incorporate them for the final submissions in July 16. Uh, next slide, please, Dan. So we would like to have your feedback in four main categories. Uh, it has been laid out by four questions here. The first one is, does the process provide reasonable level of standardizations? Does it allow DNOs to project local trends accurately? The next question is, what are the benefits and drawbacks of greater defect standardizations? The third question, will the proposed approach and time scale in a, enable wider stakeholders to fully engage with defects? And finally, should there be any ongoing process involving a stakeholder to review and update DFS processes each year? Uh, many thanks uh, for your attention. Let me know if you have any questions.
Harry, we have we have a question. Put it to all. So uh, I think the, the first question is from Helen. Uh, so, uh, we, we have had discussions about uh, what we need to present the customer. Uh, as we discussed, it would be the so one thing that we have agreed is to present a result, a volumes for a specific building blocks for all of our GSPs or uh, primaries. We also have agreed to publish our megawatt forecasts. And we have also agreed to publish our profiles, but there is no agreement in the way that we publish them, if that's the question here. Yeah. And let me go to the next question. I think I have already touched on that. Uh, is there any other question? Thank you all. Uh, Jason, uh, I think if we go to the next slide, you could have my my uh, email and John's email. So please feel free to contact us and let us know what your view is on defense standardization. Thanks, Harry. Thank you, Jason. I think there's an echo here, so apologies for that. Um, yeah, I think any any reflections on that? Again, a lot of material in here. Um, we will be publishing our proposals. Uh, they're out there. So again, um, any feedback, uh, welcome back to Paddy, John, or or more generally to the open network at energynetworks.org. Um, I think uh, Ray, Ray made a comment about the sort of organic involvement of DFES, which um, obviously we've seen over the last few years and, and hopefully our initiative here um will will help to standardize um as as helen is saying to to make things more more user friendly and, and easier for um stakeholders to to synthesize okay should we move on dan so i'll hand over to uh, to jill Um, okay, I've just unmuted. Um, apologies. Um, hi, thanks a lot for that, uh, Jason. Um, so I'm uh, Jill Williamson, Strategic Planning Manager at Electricity Northwest, uh, and I've got the pleasure of leading Workstream 1B Product 5 and representing the other uh, GB network operators uh, today. Um, and we're really pleased to have the opportunity to present our work at an early stage um, in the product, really, um, earlier than uh, product two that Hadi's just been talking about, um, and receive your thoughts um, and inputs on the direction and the shape of our deliverables. Uh, we've got our next product five meeting next week, and I'm, I'm looking forward to sharing your feedback and thoughts and comments uh, with the rest of the team. And it's very much um, along the lines of what Helen was talking about in her question to Hadi just there, um, is that we're looking um, at increasing um, stakeholder utility um, and making um, DNO reporting more user friendly. That's really what we're, we're all about. Um, and it's reports on network capacity. It's what um, and how we evaluate network capacity, um, and importantly, how we share information um, on network capacity, not only to be transparent, but also to empower uh, stakeholders. Uh, so on this slide, we've got the agenda. Um, I'd like to introduce our work, uh, and then look at a little bit more uh, detail on what uh, we could standardize in our network capacity reports and what uh, would be useful to our stakeholders um, and then quickly touch on how we're intending to assess the cost benefits um, of creating and, and sharing st standard network capacity reports. So Dan, we move on to the next slide. Um, 
This is exactly what you've just seen in Hadis and actually um, is a, a sort of um, a detailed look at, um, at one of the aspects of one of Jason's slides. So you should be very familiar with this now. Um, effectively, Workstream 1B product 5 picks up uh, where um, Hadis product 2 stops. And Hadi um, explained that product 2 is looking to standardize the definition of future scenarios and those forecast parameters, such as the numbers of electric vehicles and heat pumps and DG capacity and efficiencies. And products two then is looking at how those are converted into electrical forecasts, um, such as how much um, demand and how much generation um, there, there could be um, in the future. Now, product five is picking up from those electrical forecasts um, and product five is looking at how those forecasts um, reflect on the impact on our network. So it's the impact of where future demand and generation um, will be on our network um, and also tell how we will tell everybody uh, where there may be future issues on our network and equally where they're, they're uh, will be opportunities in our network. So I hope that just puts it in a bit of context. Moving on to the next slide, Dan. I, I wanted to, to start um, by reflecting on how really important um, forecasts are in reflecting the future uncertainty in our network planning. Um, and I hope that this, this sort of diagram illustrates that for, for you. We need to consider forecasts when we analyse network capacity due to the timescales involved. So implementing solutions at highest voltages uh, takes more time. It takes more time to build new assets or it takes time to arrange more active network uh, solutions. And we have to take that time into consideration when we're identifying where there will be needs for network solutions. So we use forecasts sort of for the next five to 10 years to do that. Um, as shown by the, the first oval on that diagram. However, the, the solutions that we will implement could endure um, for the whole lifetime um, of equipment. So we have to consider that longer duration when we're deciding what sort of solutions to employ. Um, so we're looking further into the future, sort of 2050 direction, um, where there's greater uncertainty and our forecasts cover a wider range as shown by that second oval. And we also think that different stakeholders will be interested in different date ranges and the forecasts for different scenarios. So I'd really appreciate your view um, on that a little bit later. Moving on down. Um, here we've got um, more information on the objectives of Workstream 1B uh, Product 5. And it was set up in March this year with three objectives. The first two are about standardising how network capacity is evaluated um, and how these indications are shared. And then the final objective concerns the actual implementation of the standardised approach that we develop. Uh, so why are we doing this? Well, it's recognised that network impact um, is an in, important implementation of the DFES. Um, Ofgem recently referred to this as DFES with purpose. Um, and indeed, one of the purposes of DFES is understanding impacts on our network so that we can plan um, in an economic and efficient manner. And standardisation of how we assess that impact um, and how the results are publicised um, to, to increase that user friendliness um, and to increase that utility um, is, is equally important just as standardisation of the DFES is important. Um, it's considered that we will achieve greater efficiency and um, increased stakeholder involvement 
through um, producing consistent uh, DNO uh, reports on network capacity um, and data. Lipping on Dan looks quite similar, just to give you an update. Um, we are on program and well on with the first two objectives. Um, and we're looking for implementation um, early next year. So um, hopefully that will also be in program. Moving on, Dan. So the purpose of this slide is to give you a little bit more detail about what we've been doing um, and what we will do to deliver those first two objectives. So the first things we've done is surveyed all of the ways that the network operators are currently evaluating network capacity and sharing the results. Because actually there's quite a lot of um, activity already happening um, and we will be able to use those to identify the opportunities um, within this product. So we've used the learning from the survey to define how we um, will define a standardised network assessment um, and how we could standardise publicising that information. And the next step that we're looking at will be a cost benefit analysis that we intend to undertake to ensure that the value of the pro proposed standardised approach um, is equitable to the benefits that we're, we're hoping will be derived. A little bit more on that um, later on. Um, and we will use both of those aspects um, and building blocks to um, make our recommendation. Um, when we will have our second report, the first report on the survey I cover in the next slide. Dan, please. Thank you. So sorry, this this text is a bit, uh, this slide's a bit text heavy, but there really was a lot of good information arising um, from the survey on current network operator approaches for assessing and, and publicising network capacity. So I had a lot to squeeze onto one slide. So the report um, on that survey is now available on the ENA website and I encourage you uh, to take um, a more detailed look uh, following that link there. Um, this report was a collaborative report um, from the Product 5 team, and we've also sought uh, feedback from the Workstream 1B uh, team and, and the wider um, Open Networks uh, committees. Um, in a nutshell, what we found um, was that there is an, a good number of network capacity reports being produced by the DNOs um, already. And there is already some consistency in those reports, um, in particular around the mandated reports. Um, and these are the reports um, which are uh, perhaps required by um, in accordance with regulatory obligations. Um, and we also find that there are certain parameters um, that we could use to define a standardised network capacity report in the future. So um, those would include the extent of the network covered by the report, uh, the date range that's covered um, the, um, within the network capacity analysis, the use of scenarios, uh, and also how the reports are presented, where they're presented and, and how often they're, they're updated. Importantly, we also uh, found that certain parameters, um, we understand now why they're, they're done the way they are and the reason behind differences. Um, and, and from that, begin to understand some of the potential uh, barriers um, or um, issues around standardisation. Um, so the reports that we found, um, should we move on to the next slide, Dan? 
Here, here are a few ex examples of where we're already reporting network capacity, long-term development statement, uh, which is obviously public domain, um, as are the heat maps um, and the system-wide resource register, uh, and then other reports which are uh, for specific um, audiences, the load index and P27. Also in the public domain, we, we see that uh, DNOs are also publishing uh, their DFES. Um, and we use this way of presenting to begin to assimilate our, our findings and um, we show that different, uh, these dots are different reports that we're using at the moment. And you can see on the axis, X axis, we've got reports which relate to one or multiple scenarios. And on the Y axis, we've got the date range. You can see that um, only one type of, only the DFES reports are now reporting on multiple scenarios and for that long-term future up to 2030 or, or 2050. If we can move on down. Um, essentially, we were able to identify where there's gaps with potential for standardization. Um, and I'd appreciate your views on whether it's useful to have a standardized report to fill these gaps um, a little bit later. So we're considering the purpose and the audience um, of potential standardized network capacity reports. And we're seeking your inputs also um, on those aspects and um, inputs to uh, the, the CBA to evaluate our potential proposal. Um, so the, the gaps are, are shown there with the hashed um, areas. So these are the potential opportunities for the standardised report. If we can move on, Dan. So with the CBA, uh, we're really looking to use that as part of the process for determining what would be a useful and appropriate uh, standardised network capacity report um, so that we can ensure that the investment in preparing and sh sharing those reports uh, will uh, deliver equitable benefits. The costs we're probably um, more comfortable with, to be honest with you, um, they're associated with the effort in preparing the reports and they may involve some capital um, IT investment if a network operator doesn't already have the required capability. Benefits um, are perhaps a bit more tricky to um, quantify and that's um, be really good to get your input on that. Um, because we think that the benefits are most likely going to be for stakeholders. So the network operators may see um, more preferable uh, connections coming in because they're at locations um, where there is available capacity. And we may also see greater involvement with network solutions um, as we are publicizing network needs um, in a more a cl in a clearer manner. Um, but the customers will probably be benefiting uh, from less expensive connections and also uh, greater opportunities for uh, delivering more network services. Um, so we, we need to begin to um, quantify those benefits uh, for the stakeholder um, in order to um, get a, a, a useful CBA uh, for this proposal. So moving on. Thanks, Dan. Um, so I hope that I've mentioned throughout where we'd like your inputs and views. Um, but here, just as Hazi, as Hadi did, um, I've summarised uh, the areas that we'd like um, your inputs with questions. Now, I know that we're getting to the end of a really long meeting, um, and I appreciate that everybody's probably getting a bit 
tired and, and potentially hungry. So uh, please feel free to contact me after this meeting if, if you want to share thoughts later uh, today or this week or beyond. I'm always happy uh, to talk and, and correspond. But overall, we're interested in how you think stakeholders will use or benefit from the standardised uh, network capacity reports. Um, so, and, and some detail within that, really, what what sort of timelines um, would you foresee stakeholders uh, being interested in? Uh, so. In, as I explained that in, in our um, use of the forecast, we need uh, to look at the short term where we need to understand um, immediate needs for, for our network. And, and actually, probably at that time, the variation between the forecast is not as great. And it may be that we can use the central forecast as a proxy uh, for the range of um, forecasts, uh, but we're also interested in the uh, longer term so that we can assess whole life um, impacts. And that's where there is greater uncertainty and greater uh, range of forecasts. So it's really important that we, we look at all of the forecasts at that point. Um, and so you may consider that stakeholders have equally got um, interest in a particular or the whole range of, of scenarios. So I'd like your, your views on that. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, and also we'd be interested in uh, your thoughts on what level of standardization is appropriate. Hadi has already uh, reflected um, on the advantages and disadvantages of either um, standardising um, to, a, to a, a, a lighter or a heavier um, level of detail. So it'd be really good to get your views on that. Um, so let's just having a quick look um, at any questions um, or points that have come in. Um, to date. So, Graham says, in signposting, in the signposting data, uh, we're keen to understand sensitivities and assumptions too. So, developers of flexibility in the area understand whether the requirement is likely uh, to endure or be de displaced over time, either by a reinforcement or other connectees, developments, and business closures. That's, that's a really good point. I suppose that is um, uh, suggesting there is definite value of considering multiple scenarios, Graham. Um, the, the scenarios that Hadi has referred to would be well defined. Um, and therefore, you can understand the underlying um, assumptions for those scenarios and perhaps understand uh, some of the the sensitivities um, and potential probabilities with with those scenarios. So um, your suggestion would be report network capacity for the range of scenarios um, so that we understand um, whether or not the requirements are enduring or not. Yeah, good point. Thank you for that. So. Um, I think that's the last question on there, Dan. Um, so in the absence of any further comments, I um, really would encourage people to um, get in touch. After, if you think of anything, anything pops to, um, to mind, please get in touch. And the next slide, Dan, has got contact details for myself and also uh, for John uh, West, who has um, been a great help in uh, coordinating um, and, and providing lots of support and um, inputs to product five. So yeah, please, please be in touch um, and we would appreciate your, your inputs. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Um, just pause a minute, see if there are any other questions after um, Graham's.
Okay, good. Thank you. If you can move it on, Dan, we're in grave danger of pe giving people the gift of time here. Um, Dan, can you move on to the, just the last slide? Thank you very much. So, yep, that's that's a wrap, everyone. Thank you for all um, your uh, attention. Um, I'm glad we've got a decent break in the middle because it is content heavy, this advisory group, and obviously not ideal uh, remotely and not getting together and having more interaction. So um, we'll, we'll continue to uh, operate without any face-to-face -face meetings for the rest of this year, at least, as you're all aware. So um, we will continue with this format, which I must admit, we did get good feedback last time. So, and, and I think that's dependent on the level of your attention and engagement. So I um, really appreciate um, you doing that and, and continuing the Q and A's coming in through, um, each of the topics. So that's, um, that's really great. Um, Dan, I think in the slides, there is a link to the feedback in, um, in, in the slides that are published. Is that right? Uh, yep, that's correct. Um, but we'll also, um, send it around afterwards because we've got a few materials that we want to, to follow up with. Yeah. Oh, great. So for those of you that have downloaded the um, slide deck as 